Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. I'm here in the Royal College of General Practitioners in London at the PHC UK conference. And I'm meeting now with Arjun Panasar, yeah, who is an IT expert at a high level, but now is the leader of one of the biggest diabetes organizations in the world. And if I may say so, one of the most effective and useful. So great to see you, Arjun. Yeah, morning, it's great to see you. Yeah, excellent. And I'd love to talk a little at first about that. How did you transition from being an IT expert into something as specific and medical as diabetes? Well, it was way back in 2003, and I was studying for an undergraduate degree in artificial intelligence down the road at Imperial College London. And my grandfather happened to suffer a quadruple heart bypass in May 2003, or maybe February 2003. Around about sort of April, May time, he was, asking, he was asking the whole family what he should be eating because he had subsequently developed type 2 diabetes based on uh, essentially the, his health status. He wasn't sure what to eat, nor was the rest of our family. And we're from quite a multicultural family, uh, look, sort of Caucasian um, origins. We have sort of Indian origins. Uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a mix. And so we have lots of different types of breads that he could choose from, but he still wasn't quite sure what was most effective for his condition. So we started diabetes.co.uk, which at the time was the world's first digital community for people with diabetes. That was 2003, so 16 years later, 2019, we're the world's largest community for people with diabetes. And we have really used, I guess, my expertise or built upon my expertise in AI and computing in order to understand the needs or the concerns of the community um, as a population set and then provide interventions or digital health solutions for them. Right. And actually, Arjun, I kind of misspoke there on IT, as I perceived it. It's really AI, artificial intelligence. But you have got all expertise in IT as well in terms of all those structures. Yeah. So I'm a software engineer, I guess, computer. I'm a software engineer through and through uh, with a specialism really in AI. And the data that we've collected over the last 15 years, we have you know over 1.2 million members and almost 100 different data points on, on each person that sort of three, six, nine month intervals. So what we can see is really fascinating. But then when you look at what people are talking about, that's even more fascinating because with sort of the, the AI side, natural language processing, it's really interesting because you can begin to see elements of the future or uh, concerns that may, may, may spring out in the future. Right, you're seeing all, all those signals that are usually buried in the noise are all coming out. Yeah, so way back in 2012, we conducted the world's largest survey for people with diabetes, 20,000 people answering 75 questions over the course of four weeks. When we analyzed the data, we had over 1.5 million data points. And what was really obvious was that patients with type 2 diabetes in particular wanted more structured information when it came to food. If I think about when we started diabetes.co.uk, the first forum post was about bread and the impact of bread on blood sugar levels. So so that sort of the concept of carbohydrates has always been a huge, huge area of misinformation, misinformation, maybe a bit too strong, but people just weren't sure. People were being diagnosed, told to diet and exercise. Whilst they were dieting and exercising, they were still gaining weight. That was, you know, it's, it's the same old story, really. And so as we have developed, the low carb program has really been able to provide a more structured intervention for people. Um, and that's essentially how we've developed from diabetes.co.uk as a patient community into providers of digital health solutions uh, with academic, you know, with, with medical partners or, you know, medical and academic uh, supervision and, and sort of complementary services, really. Yeah, because a resource as massive as, as yours, as you've described, you know, that should be leveraged by the medical organizations. And I think recently, I guess it'd be important to get engaged with the NHS, especially in the UK. But recently you've you've achieved or succeeded in getting a fellowship of some sort with the NHS. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the low carb program was selected by the NHS Innovation Accelerator a couple of months back. So I think it was February as part of this year's fellowship. So I was selected on behalf of Diabetes Digital Media and the low carb program to take part in that. And the NIA looks to scale high impact innovations in the NHS and wider healthcare system. So what's fascinating is that we have the NHS now backing the low carb program and backing the concept of scalable type two diabetes remission. 
which is a fascinating step forward, I think, for, for everyone and, and, and anyone involved in, in the low carb space because it's only three, four, five years ago that it, it, you know, it just wasn't part of the treatment pathway, um, but now absolutely is. Yeah, that's that's amazing, Arjun. And the other thing is, of course, we've heard again and again, uh, diabetes is a chronic progressive disease. It will get worse. You just have to manage it. And then increasingly, you will require insulin as the disease worsens. And that's completely untrue. Absolutely. I, w- I will never forget watching Jason say type 2 diabetes doesn't have to be a chronic and progressive disease. And as soon as you understand that paradigm of insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, if you're data led, perhaps, or if you're evidence based, perhaps, then you would naturally uh, that's naturally where you find yourself. And for people who aren't as lucky to, to land in the evidence base, if they can Google it and, fights and find sites like ours, that is, that's exactly what we want. But now we have the NHS offering the opportunity to, to onboard yourselves into these interventions. That's great, because what we want is these types of solutions in primary care. Absolutely, uh, to help as many people as possible. And God knows there are so many diabetics now. It's, it's an enormous cohort. And that uh, ex- you did a live experiment. And I remember actually myself and Dr. Gerber in our book, Eat Rich, Live Long, we featured it as one of the few examples of how where low carb is going. At the time, you had 120,000 people or so, I think, and an average weight loss of 10 or more kilos and glycemic control improving. Not randomized, but but the wisdom of crowds and tracking all their data. This is it. So we started, I think we were at PHC three years ago talking about 120,000 anecdotes. And tomorrow we'll be presenting on our journey into the NHS and scaling type 2 remission to over 410,000 members. So I think it's, we're in a space now where we, we can talk about weight loss, A1C reduction, demedication. People are able to, to deal with demedication. So healthcare professionals now are very good at medicating, but not so good at demedicating. So our senior medical officers, our, our chief medical officer, Dr. Renwin, Dr. Dr. Campbell Murdoch have have contributed to, to evidence to demonstrate how we can safely deprescribe. So we've been actually forging the academic evidence base alongside the development of the real world evidence base. And as an engineer, that's where I, I find it's, you know, it's really interesting. Yeah, for sure. And it is important. I mean, some people could argue that we have enough research done to answer our primary questions, especially in the diabetes sphere. But publication, official academic work is important, along with all of the other structures. So Laura Saslow, who was just recently involved in the ADA guidance update, was lead author on our paper, along with Dr. Unwin, along with uh, Charlotte Summers, who also who I also work with. And I think it's it's fair to say we're the only digital intervention, digital only intervention, so no human interaction that is able to scale remission. So at the end of a year, we see around about one in two patients complete the program and completing the program means they've gone through all 12 modules. If they do so, on average, they'll lose 7.4 kilos, which is around about 7% of their weight, of their body weight, uh, reduced their A1C by 13 millimoles per mole, so 1.2%, and 39% of people reduce their A1C, the HbA1c, sorry, under the type 2 diagnosis threshold. We then went a little bit further to look at demedication, and 40% of people who started on a medication were deprescribed it. And consequently, there is a 26% remission rate. So 26% of patients who completed the program were in type 2 remission at three years, um, sorry, at one year. And this is part of a three-year study looking at the sustainability of type 2 diabetes remission, but also whether a digital intervention can maintain these long-term behavior changes that we need. Right, or indeed enhancements with time even increase the initial figures. But there's obviously a financial impact here as well, deprescribing, I mean, medications that are an enormous cost. So that's another benefit to society. So with the medication, the, well, with the demedication statistics, we were able to identify an 835 pounds per patient year saving in demedication. So that doesn't take into account progression of disease. It doesn't take into account hospital admissions. It doesn't take into account doctor time, resources, etc. We are just looking at medication deprescription, essentially. And so the impact from that, if you, if you can emulate what Dr. Unwin has done in every surgery in the UK, I think it's around about £365 million saving a year. And I think what we're able to understand is we don't necessarily need everyone to understand the lower carbohydrate approach in order to, to necessarily give this to their patients. This just needs to be a choice. Choice needs to be the new religion. And if people can, can choose this intervention, we know that one in four of, of people, you know, one in four of the participants who take the program 
will end up in remission. And, and, and the op opportunity to scale that, the opportunity to add people in, to add health coaches in in order to help support people, goes to demonstrate that A, we can achieve a greater percentage of remission, uh, but B, we can actually work with groups or rather than one-on-one -on -one in a digital intervention, you can actually work in that group setting and you can begin to take it offline. So a blended model. So that, that you really, for the AI geek in me, it, it's how we create the, this blended model of care that is the challenge. Yeah, no, it sounds fantastic. It's exactly where it should go in the modern age of technology, no doubt about it. And you've got, yeah, there's less one-on-one -on -one from experts because people are sharing. They're also getting support network. They're getting tips. They're getting to hear the major issues. They're getting to share their stories. So there's all of this beyond just each patient you know, getting a program and trying to follow it is a huge network. It needs to be right for you. It needs to be culturally relevant. It needs to be localized to your health economy. You need, to, you know, you need to see the foods that you normally eat. There's no point in me showing my grandfather Warburton's bread and you know all, all of these you know delicious of what he perceives to be used to perceive to be delicious foods. You know, I need to show him things that he expects, like chapatis, and and I need to show him the appropriate food swap. So. Rather than him changing his his sort of his Warburton, he he we actually need to change his chapatis because he doesn't eat so many sandwiches, but he eats lots of Indian food in the evenings and with lots of chapatis and you know obviously sort of tons of flour um, and and sort of you know starchy carbs with that. So it's just how we can re-educate people in their right setting. So Dr. Sadra does a great job in Slough, and what we've been able to do is take what he does in Slough with a South Asian population bring it into the app. So if you happen to be of South Asian origin, you speak Punjabi, you would actually see someone engaging with you in your language about your foods. Uh, you, and, and what we found is because it's more engaging, the health outcomes are better. And what's fascinating is if we can, if we can hyper personalize the experience, evidence based medicine wants to achieve uh, personalization of medicine to, to sort of every, every particular patient and digital allows us to achieve this before you go into the sort of the data, ethical privacy concerns and all of those pieces, uh, the opportunity if you use it for good is, 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 you know, is absolutely immense. Immense, yeah, because you can, uh, people can naturally cluster into their own kind of cultural groups and that, that's contextual then. They'll mm. have the similar problems, similar foods they're replacing. It, it's kind of perfect. So what, are, and you, when you mentioned Charlotte, I think Charlotte, as, as long as I've known you guys, you, you've both been diabetes.co.uk. Does that go back to the very initial so Charlotte joined in 2012. So she joined originally as a researcher. So diabetes.co.uk as a, as a community has been in existence since 2003. But we've only been a limited company for, for six years, six years, seven years. Yeah. So Charlie actually joined in 2012 as a researcher and or as a psychology sort of, you know, really interested in the psychology of, of, can, we, of can we as an organization make behavior change from a digital platform translate into offline behavior change. And you know, she's, the relationships she has built with our medical officers and our academic partners has gone to demonstrate that we can do that. And it's fair to, you know, she's not here, but it's, and, and so I can't inflate her ego too much, but it's fair to say that the work that she's done has been absolutely tremendous. She's localized our platforms into three different countries. Uh, so we're in the UK, Ireland, and Canada, uh, into four different languages. And, and Charlie is really the, the person responsible for for having these 1.2 million people within the platform. I'm, I'm really just the person who does, does the tech side, but it's actually Charlie who has been leading the education, the development of it, the localization of it, and, and also then bringing it together and then launching it within a market which involves the health bodies, the insurers perhaps, uh, you know, governmental agencies, and then perhaps charities. And, and I guess that's where it could get a little bit sticky. <laughs> Yes, and it's really going for a fully integrated model with all all aspects, all vectors, all tied together properly. No, it, it just, I love it. <laughs> it sounds fantastic. And growing to nearly half a million members, I mean, that is, well, I was going to say hyper growth. It's rapid growth, incredibly rapid growth. Maybe we'll, we'll curl to a close now on diabetes.co.uk is this fantastic organization, hugely effective uh, I have massive respect for it, but Diabetes UK, very similarly named, that's a kind of a diabetes charity, but they seem to to have very outdated guidance. And is that just a, an orthodox establishment? I think it's changing. They, the, the, the guidance was recently updated maybe last year to say that a lower carbohydrate approach was, was useful for, for some adults with type 2 diabetes. 
there is progression, I think. You know, if you look, when you, when you sort of go online and you look at those sort of all the, the various camps when it, when it comes to, I guess, these, these crazy diet wars, um, I think we both share the opinion that it's about choice. And I think choice has to be the thing that we put forward. So I think our shared goal uh, as diabetes.co.uk with Diabetes UK would be that we want to empower patients. And, and, and ultimately how we do that is, is either with knowledge and information and, and sort of interventions Perhaps, perhaps I guess because of the size of the organization, it's, it may be slightly harder or slightly longer to be able to sort of filter that evidence all the way out into what you're advising patients. But I think because we've never really had a medical bias, our medical officers have really helped guide what we do. We've, we've always been data led. So the moment the data or the evidence demonstrates something, we've, we felt an obligation to share that with people. And so, you know, Dr. Unwin, Campbell, uh, Skessa, you know, they've all done a tremendous job really in helping us personalize that, but also keep us up to date and relevant, uh, because the worst thing would be sort of arming people with the wrong information. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And you have to you have to go with current information because the paradigms are changing really fast in this sphere. So you got to give people latest. Now, there's always the danger, obviously, if there's one animal study that comes out that says something unusual, you don't say, hey, guys, let's try this. But but you're talking about a preponderance of data, which interestingly, what David Unwin and the fantastic work he's been doing uh, with his patients and the, and the amazing results he's getting, you know, it's not even like this is completely new and at odds with science, because if you go back decades and even 100 years, we're kind of going back to what was done with diabetes a long, long time ago. And the literature is stuffed with the scientific justification for this approach. So it's actually all all beautifully coming together in a sense. We've just had to convince everyone that it's always been there. <laughs> yeah, that's where I was wondering. Some other organizations are stuck in a paradigm of the last 40 or 50 years, which was cholesterol-centric, fat is bad. And I, I think the fat is bad mistake or mistaken belief just kind of flipped a carb must be good. And then diabetics who are more exposed to coronary vascular disease supposedly would need to be more careful of fat so it's good for them too to have less fat and more carb and, and once that became the paradigm it became it seems like it became literally cast in granite uh, and you're it became impossible is, to shift in it yeah, yeah and, and i think you're talking about chipping away the granite now so you know you need need to stick at it 10 years ago we we were engaging with public bodies and they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't approve our diabetes.co.uk forum because we allowed as they as they put it unregulated and uncensored communications between users and what were they talking about they were talking about how to use a low-carb high-fat diet to manage their type 2 diabetes it is really interesting what was once considered to be inflammatory is now considered to be almost standard protocol and so there is a space for disruption that I think digital is, is able to provide. And if you are data led, and, and I guess because we're a digital organization, it's been far easier to follow the data. So our culture is, is just, is, is, it has been adapted really. And, and that's got a lot to do with, I guess, my experience, Charlotte's experience, but then also not having a medical, not actually having a bias, our bias actually being what works for people. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just thinking I did a course some time ago. I'm not software. I'm, I'm biochemical and mechanical and all that stuff. But uh, I did a brief course on Agile, which was the project management for software development. So there you go. You are the perfect example of an Agile organization. Yeah, you have to listen to the people. Oh, yeah, that is the key, because there is the wisdom of crowds. And sure, some people get things wrong. They see correlations rather than causations. But when you're dramatically improving your own health and it's so manifest to you sharing that helps other people and comparing experiences well we did a study on exactly that so we teamed up with royal holloway university of london to look at the benefits of being within a digital community because they've been so there's been so little research on it and what they found was that if you are a member of a digital community like ours it is a in it is a catalyst of innovation and it empowers patients What's fascinating is they then went on to define what empowerment meant. And empowerment meant you had a better understanding of your condition, a greater self-efficacy in, in the management of your condition, and you had a greater perceived quality of life. That's all, that's all part of being in a digital community. So you may never see these people, but they just happen to be at your side 24 seven, seven days a week. It's, it's just so interesting to see the impact that that can have on someone. So after six months, one in two people who is a who posts on the community has improved their glucose levels 
what would happen if they were on that for a year or 18 months or two years? And I guess that's where the behavior change concept comes in. And, and that's really Charlotte's piece, but readiness to change. Some people want to be on medications, some people don't. You know, when is the right time? Is it even ethical to persuade someone who wants to be on a medication, you know, who, who, who can't achieve remission to, to ask them or to, to persuade them to achieve remission? They're the sort of questions of the future that, that Charlotte's looking at addressing in terms of the psychology of remission, whether we can, pers whether we can market remission in a way and is it ethical to market in a, in a way that affects other people because it's you know we've 26 percent is a great place to start but can we get to 50 percent can we get to 75 percent um you know that's a challenge continuous improvement exactly yeah but that's no that just resonates so much with me it's the way to go and all of that success you've been fighting swimming upstream in a sense now i know you've had the autonomy and independence to be able to work away yourself but just outside is is resistance that you, we described but imagine when the orthodoxy rather than just saying it's one choice maybe for some imagine when the orthodoxy switches over and begins to acknowledge it's it's the primary most common sense choice not for everyone but you know then you've got the support from the kind of the macro structures around society along with all of what you described and that that's when it could really blow up this is it this is it absolutely uh, insurance reinsurance is really one of the key drivers we we have two partnerships with the two reinsurance organizations to see our interventions to 16 million people in the next four years the appetite internationally is far less they don't they don't resist the concept of reducing sugar in the same way that we have seen here and so we are going into countries that have huge obesity epidemics where sugar is marketed in the likes of cokes and pepsis on billboards and you know where sugarcane is is one of the greatest exports to change the paradigm of a country like that is really fascinating and you do need the backing of the of the insurers because they're typically working with the with the governments and the agencies in order to provide care and the challenges that we face on a on, on a daily basis are are exactly that. How do you how do you transfer that knowledge not only to the provider that you would like to disseminate that knowledge, but then also to people? Uh, so localizing it, making sure that it's it's appropriate. You know those kinds of challenges. Um, they are challenging, but we seem to have support everywhere we've gone. We, we've had you know complete support. Other than in when we went over to China and we discussed perhaps reducing rice and, and it wasn't met with, 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 with such great reception. So, so the appetite is absolutely there. I think, I think where there are public health bodies that are in charge of the, the, the nation's purse, it's always going to be a little bit trickier because the resistance, you know, because risk mitigation is really what, what, what these systems are all about. So arguably there, there, there is a reason for, for why it takes so long, but internationally has been far easier for us than in the UK. Great stuff. Yeah, I know it's going to move all over the world and I will. OK, so diabetes.co.uk. Important not to mix it up with the other organization. And it just occurs to me, I put in a little plug for uh, Type 1 Grit on Facebook, which is obviously not nearly as evolved with, with R.D. Dykeman. Yeah. But for Type 1s on Facebook, you just see the streams of messages comparing their kids, blood glucose is all under control. And you can just sense the mutual support. This it, is it's it. amazing. This is it. I was I, I I was ecstatic when I saw that paper. I remember speak, speaking to Ardi, and he was said and he said, "What do you think of the paper?" I said, "It's fascinating. I think it's absolutely amazing." And he said, "Well, what's your perspective?" And I said, "Well, I'm just amazed that they have been able, you know, the an the analysis of Facebook posts, of social media posts, in order to it, that have been peer reviewed, that are published in a journal such as that." For me, it was, you know, it was, it's the piece de resistance. And, and he was, well, what do you think about the science? So, and I said, flawless. I think, but for me, it's the fact that social communities, you know, these swarms of people, these essentially these communes are able to, to help each other digitally. And, and for, I think the only problem that we have now is you currently have to be very lucky in your Google search, or you have to be able to know the right search terms to find the right place for the right information. And it is our obligation or it's our job to make sure that these are provided within this is your primary line of care. So these should be these should be offered to you, these interventions or this information when you're first diagnosed rather than rather than really just being lucky in your search term. Of course. Well, let's hope for that in the coming few years, hopefully. And I think it'll take a decade before a lot of this to really get into the establishment as in acceptance of paradigms that are new like this that just makes sense but uh, we we'll hope for that so thanks a lot Arjun great meeting you again awesome thank you cheers Bye.
Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.